It's now time for The Sit Down with Don Tony. The Sit Down, where Don Tony talks one on one with his followers. What are you looking at? About the world of pro wrestling, pop culture, and so much more. The Sit Down with Don Tony. And now, your host, Don Tony. The boss is back. Happy Friday, everybody. It is March 29th, 2024. I tell you, after not doing video for, uh, what, two weeks? I got to get used to looking at the camera again. How you all doing tonight? This is The Sit Down. I am Don Tony, and SmackDown just went off the air. Uh, not a bad episode. Uh, I will tell you right off the bat, I'm a little bit disappointed at some of the matches that appear to be coming out of uh, WrestleMania 40. Um, tonight on SmackDown, even though some of the matches have not been yet made official or stipulations, even to that extent, you know, a couple of matches are pretty much set. And I tell you, I don't want, I don't want WrestleMania 40 to be remembered for two matches, maybe three. I mean, if our truth and the Miz win the tag titles, you know, it's a fun moment. We all love our truth. Seeing them have gold again is pretty freaking cool. But, you know, is that going to be something that we're going to talk about five years from now? No. Um, Sami Zayn dethroning Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. Gunther is going to have to lose at some point. Gunther has definitely made this championship feel bigger than what it's been in recent memory. That's why I said I don't want WrestleMania to be remembered for three matches. Well, maybe even four if you want to count Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins, especially if there's a cash-in. And I'm starting to wonder after SmackDown tonight that Damian Priest cashes in unsuccessfully almost feel like failure might be needed to get Damian Priest to the next level. And I know some of you right now are saying to me, DT, what the hell are you talking about? Failure to get to the next level? Yeah, it does happen sometimes. Sometimes you win when you lose. Uh, the most infamous one for me in the last couple of decades is Steve Austin, WrestleMania 13 with Bret Hart. In that loss, you know, he won big time. Um, there's got to be cracks in the judgment day, Dominic Mysterio uh, being involved in a tag match. Why would the judgment day be so concerned about that? I feel like they have to add the stipulation, you know, hair versus mask. I don't like Ray and Dragon Lee teaming up to take on Santos and Dominic unless there's a stipulation on the line. Just a tag match? That feels like SmackDown to me. So I'm hoping they add the stipulation. The problem is we only have one week left. We only have one week left. And you almost feel like that stipulation has to be made on television in a promo. If WWE just announces it on social media, uh, even though we'd be happy with it, we'd also be like, where did this come from? Like, don't you think Dominic and Santos want to embarrass Ray and you put your mask on the line? What are you guys going to put on the line? Oh, I have an idea. How's about we take your hair? It has to be a confrontation. It has to be a promo. And I'm wondering, with only one week away, is that going to happen? And my gut feeling says no. And that's going to be really disappointing, my friends. Also... The tag team ladder match. I mean, we. I know this is not a high-definition picture. I haven't had a chance to get photos yet. But this is your lineup for the ladder match for the Undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. And I know you all say them right off the bat. Street Profits are not in it. We got Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, which for a long time we were under the impression that they these two guys are going to be fighting one-on-one -on -one against each other. 
If they're going to hold that off until SummerSlam, fine with me. But Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, okay. I like them as a tag team. The Awesome Truth, yeah, we've already talked about that. Judgment Day obviously defending the titles. DIY, although they have moments, as far as an established over tag team that the WWE Universe is just behind, no, that's not the case. Anybody that tries to tell you otherwise is a liar. The New Day have been there, done that. Do they really need another run? No. And the New Catch Republic, sorry, sorry. It's just not, you know, something that's going to end up with them going to the next level. So I look at this and I'm saying this is what the best of the tag team division had to offer after all of this time. That's why in some way I'm, as of right now, I'm kind of hoping that the Judgment Day retain at WrestleMania. But, hey, predictions are not until next week. And Kevin and I are going to be doing predictions. We are unsure yet which night we are going to do it. It's either going to be Tuesday night or it's going to be Wednesday night coming up. It will be recorded in advance. We will not be doing it live. If we do it Tuesday night, then it might be streaming live on Patreon. But the thing is, is that, you know, we want to keep the predictions focused. You know, in a live show, sometimes questions come up that kind of like have nothing to do with mania. So we're going to do a preview and predictions either Tuesday or Wednesday that will be available on all platforms. So you'll be, you'll be able to access it this Monday. Kevin, and I will be live on April 1st. It is not April fools. Look at the time, 11, 15 PM after raw last week, we said that we were going to do it at 12, 15 AM. But the thing is, the reason why we were going to do it at 12, 15 a.m. is special start time is because the Bray Wyatt documentary. And we actually have a super shout out that I got to get into. That's very, very important. It has to do with the WWE Hall of Fame. I'll get into that in a moment. But, um, you know, Kevin and I last week said that we were going to start an hour later on April 1st so we could watch the Bray Wyatt documentary right after Raw. And then when we do our show, we could actually comment about the documentary. Not one person who is live stopped to tell us that they're actually releasing the documentary early Monday morning. I was not aware of that. Neither was Kev. Somebody on Twitter told us about it yesterday. Now, look, you know, I haven't checked Peacock's schedule, but if the documentary comes out early Monday, then we're going to start regular time, 11, 15 p.m. There's absolutely no reason for us to sit around and wait for an hour and then start the show. So pay attention in the community section on YouTube. I'll post it on Twitter, and I'll even put a little note on Patreon. Those are the three places that I can alert everyone. We'll let everybody know for sure that we're going to start at 11, 15 p.m. I'll also put an announcement on Discord, but... You know, based on that, if the documentary is released early Monday, then we will start normal time. So Monday we'll have our show. Tuesday will be Patreon or the prediction show. If we do predictions on Wednesday, then Tuesday will be a regular Patreon show. So we got a loaded next couple of days, and then next week we'll obviously recap and review WrestleMania. Um, I'm hoping... I'm hoping they announce the lineups on Monday. I have said this a few times already, and I'm going to say it again now. Not everybody can afford to go to both nights of WrestleMania 40. You know, some people think that one ticket gets you both nights. That's not true. And I think it's a little unfair for those paying prime money and only knowing two or three matches when they're actually, actually three matches of when they're going to happen. Drew and Seth is obviously night two. Roman and Cody is night two and the tag match is night one. You know, the rest of the card, we don't know. They haven't even officially announced any other matches other than the ladder match. And obviously the Ray and Dragon Lee versus Santos Dom match. 
but we don't even know which night it's going to air. So uh, I'll hope they start announcing some things on Monday. Um, that's why I'm a little, I don't want to say concerned. If we get an amazing main event tag match on night one, if we get an amazing match with Cody and Roman and there's going to be clusterfuck city, you know that's coming with a bunch of surprises and swerves and twists and turns as well, um, especially tonight where they're now pushing that Roman Reigns ordered, you know, what happened to Cody on Monday. So uh, you remember the idea that Roman's bossing around the rock a little bit too much? I still think that is a good possibility of happening. Um, I know what some of you are going to say. After what The Rock did to Cody, how could Cody possibly uh, forgive The Rock or let it go if The Rock ultimately turns on Roman for because Roman is being a little bit too, you know, big. I keep thinking back to Brock Lesnar. Think about the crazy brawls that Brock Lesnar and Cody Rhodes had. I think a lot of people forget all the cheap shots and the attacks and everything else. And then after that third match was done, we get a handshake and a hug and all is good in the world again. So anything is possible. If it matches the story and it makes sense and everybody likes it, it is what it is. So we'll see what happens. Um, so we are here to do the sit down for the next hour or so. I basically am here answering your questions, sharing your comments. If you super shout out, super chat, obviously you get a little VIP treatment. You go to head of the line. And I want to thank everybody who took part last Sunday's Q&A with yours truly and Kev Castle here. Uh, we don't want to turn the DTKC show into a YouTube show. Um, obviously, our channel members get the show, our patrons get the show, and everybody gets it at dontony.com, dtkcshow.com. But we do a Q&A, you know, every month or so, and it helps us obviously generate some revenue because we do pay bills and this is a job for us as well. You know, if the turnout stays like that, yeah, we'll be doing them much more often. We're not, not going to overkill it, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, we'll plan another one in the very near future. And I want to thank everybody for the birthday witches. Anybody who's been following me for years knows I'm not big on birthdays. To me, it's just another reminder that I'm one step closer to death. I know that sounds kind of shitty, but I was never into birthdays, never since I was a kid. You know, but uh, I did the Patreon show Tuesday and my Discord was frozen. I Somebody told me that I was connected to Discord until like 2 o'clock in the morning. I didn't even know my, pay, my account was frozen. Couldn't access it. I connected and then everything froze. And I was like, you know, what, let me record the show and get it done. But I saw all the birthday wishes afterwards. I saw it on Twitter. I saw it on YouTube. And I thank you all. That was very, very cool. So, uh Let's get into it, shall we? Now, I will warn everyone. Uh, three Super Chats came in before we went live. And sometimes some of you send them beforehand for two reasons. One, so your question is answered first. And number two, sometimes it requires me to pull a little research. And something that I'm going to get into, I decided to pull a little research. And, you know, if you look at the thumbnail for today's show, yeah, I like playing on words. I don't hate AEW. I don't think it's funny that they're drawing these horrible ratings and people sugarcoat it and people, you know, like Brian Alvarez, you know, no, no need for concern or panic yet. Reminds me of the movie The Naked Gun when everything is on fire and there's explosions in the background and Leslie Nielsen is like, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. Here's a little bit of truth serum for everybody out there that I don't even need to pull research because I know it is fact. They did 747,000 viewers this past Wednesday. You know what's even worse about that? Their demo was 0.23. Now, I tell everybody for years, if not decades, I don't pay attention to demos. To me, 
the more people that watch a show, the more people that might buy a pay-per-view, that might buy a ticket, that might buy merchandise. Don't give me, oh, well, you know, the demo is 0. 0.32. Yeah, the demo means 300,000 viewers. What would you rather have, guys? 300,000 people between the ages of 18 to 49, or would you rather have 800,000 people? Think about that. Would I rather have a baseball game filled with 3,000 18 to 49 year olds in a 15,000 seat stadium? Would I rather have 3,000 18 to 49 year olds or would I rather have 9,000 fans, period? You know, little kids buy merchandise, old people buy merchandise, some people buy, spend money. The only people that should be caring about the demos every single week are the advertisers, the networks, and the promoters. That's it, period. But when it's news, yeah, we got to talk about it. That point two three is the lowest that AEW Dynamite has scored in four fucking years. During the COVID era, during the empty... Uh, Charles Place, Jones Beach, whatever that fucking Daly's place in Florida. That is the last time that demo was that low in 2020. Let that sink in. And let me also say this, and I'm sorry if I piss off anybody. I, I have the right to express my viewpoints just like anybody else. I found it fucking hilarious since Wednesday to see all of these geniuses and that analyzing the rating now. And these are the same people that said that Mercedes Monet is a game changer. Okada is a game changer. Will Ospreay is a game changer. My friends, I said it the night before Mercedes debuted in AEW. I said it two weeks ago. I say it again here now. They ain't nobody in AEW that is a game changer. I even brought up Cody Rhodes three weeks after WrestleMania 38. After WrestleMania 38, three weeks after that, the ratings were lower than before Cody Rhodes joined WWE on Monday Night Raw. No singular person is a game changer. Rock could show up and Rock could have a nice quarter hour. I brought this up two weeks ago, the last time we did the sit down. Randy Orton and Logan Paul scored a higher rating than The Rock opening up SmackDown that episode, all right? No one is a game changer singularly. Collectively, different story. So when I do this thumbnail, yeah, I like playing on words. I think it's a little creative, but I'm not celebrating that this is the ratings. When you're talking about, put it this way, Okada, Monet, Osprey. Those three salaries are more than the entire NXT roster and well beyond. Just think about that. And you look at what NXT has developed in the last year or two, from your Carmelo Hayes to your Trick Williams to your Braun Breakers and the Tiffany Strattons and uh, whoever else you want to throw on that list. You can spend money. And you could have these fools on social media that think that Tony Khan is going to give them a hand job, that Tony Khan is going to give them a regular job, that Tony Khan is going to give them a super chat under an alias name because they're kissing his ass. Tony Khan ain't going to fuck you. Let's be honest here. Tony Khan obviously loves the, the ass kissing, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a reason why Warner Media has not inked the deal with AEW yet. If AEW was so goddamn hot, you don't wait all this time. It's almost a year since all these fools said that AEW signed a $1.5 billion deal for five years, whatever it was. I have said many times, I believe Warner Media will re-sign AEW. I believe AEW can be repaired and can build. But one of the biggest mistakes, I don't have any thumbnails for tonight, much nothing at all, but I kept this one. I kept this one. 
and I read things like this, that this is the poster child of what's, what's causing AEW so many problems. This got so much attention, this goof by the name of Ella Bennett, AEW wrestling fan, won't hold that against her, but she writes for a fucking major publication and she says AEW triumphs over WWE in securing top wrestling free agents. And they have Triple H with his hands over his head like, what the fuck did I do? Holy shit, did I fuck up? He didn't fuck up. The day Mercedes Monet was debuting, people doing special episodes, special rants, game changer, game changer, game changer. These people are proved wrong over and over and over again. But a good portion of that wrestling audience prefers this, prefers to feel like they're warm and cuddly than to be told the truth. Yeah, there are a shitload of fucking snowflakes out there. And Tony Khan's biggest problem, it's like a guy that buys the most exotic cars and doesn't know how to drive a stick. I think of Rocky Balboa when he bought that Trans Am and Rocky II. Do you see him trying to park the car? Hey, yo, Adrian, let's go buy a coat. You see him try to park the car because he didn't know how to drive a stick. Tony Khan could have a Mercedes, a Ferrari, an Osprey Ferrari. He could have some import Okada. If those motherfucker cars are manual transmission and you don't know how to drive a stick, you could show off the cars all you want. Hey, everybody, look. Look at the cars that I got. Look at all of the beautiful. Look at my mansion. But if you don't know how to fucking handle them, you just got a bunch of toys. And you got a, a core audience out there that all have pacifiers. They all have pacifiers. And the reason why I stopped watching AEW on a regular basis is because the perception that I get on TV is that I should be following and rooting and watching Shibata, not because AEW has given me a reason to care, not because AEW has built him to the superstar status that looks larger than life. No, it's because Excalibur told me I should, or social media says I should. Sorry for majority of wrestling fans out there, they don't give a shit that Eddie Kingston gets rock hard because he wants to tribute a match uh, for somebody in Japan. And I love Eddie Kingston. I followed his career here in Queens, New York for 20 years. And I am so happy that man got NWA, got AEW. And the guy is trying and fulfilling a dream. I love it. But for the everyday wrestling fans, no one gives a shit. That Mercedes Monet, oh, I have unfinished. This is, so let me get into one of the super chats and then we'll segue into other stuff. Who sent this earlier? Uh, give me one second to pull it up. Uh, here it is. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, some people may be surprised with my answer. Sticky Fingers Frank, thank you for the 10th spot, my friend. Has Tony Khan already dropped the ball with Mercedes, Will Ospreay, and Okada? And if so, how do you fix them? Um, yeah, he has dropped the ball. And I'll tell you why I feel he's dropped the ball and how it could be fixed. I think because The Rock is so big right now, back in the WWE, it wasn't that long ago The Rock and the WWE were not on the greatest of terms. I think back to 1999 when Chris Jericho arrived in the WWF. And he had the countdown for months and months and months. And The Rock was in the ring. And then the countdown went to zero. Chris Jericho came out there and was immediately thrown in there Dwayne The Rock Johnson in 1999. He wasn't thrown in there with, I don't want to use anybody at that time because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They threw him right against one of the big names. There was so much build and anticipation. 
that if they would have just put him against a mid Carter, people are like, oh, okay. When Goldberg, whether you like him or not, and Kevin and I just had a rant that we think Goldberg is turning into Ryback without a podcast. Goldberg, when he arrived in the WWE, which the anniversary, I think, is this week, he immediately went after The Rock, went after heavyweight gold. When Bret Hart showed up in WCW, they fucked up. They made him referee and this and that, but you still felt that Bret Hart was in world championship pitcher. Mercedes shows up, and the week Mercedes showed up, I went on this show and I said, what do you think they're going to do? The first week, okay, I'm happy to be in AEW, fine. That's all we knew of Mercedes up to that point. What did I say? We'll get like a Julie Hart or a Sky Blue to come out there. We'll get a little tease of a confrontation. Will Nightingale or Chris Statlander will show up. Go two, two weeks ago. Go listen to it. Before any of this went down, everything that I said to the T happened. The same people. Mercedes Monet says that AEW is the only place where she could take it global. Now, it sounds great. And Boston loved it. But when you dissect, it's like, oh, my God. In China, we're going to see Sky Blue versus uh, Mercedes. Or maybe Mercedes could face Soraya and break her neck this time around. Soraya could break Mercedes' neck. They don't have that kind of development roster, you know, to the point, global what does that even mean global? And what did they do? Exactly what they did with Tony Storm, exactly what they did with Ruby Soho, exactly what they did with Deanna Prazo, exactly what they did with anybody that comes in. Comes out, I'm happy to be here. Following week, cuts another promo. Uh, somebody random comes out for a challenge. You know, then they tease another match, and then they tease this, and then the person's on commentary. And then Mercedes Monet will next week will be there exactly one month that she has done nothing. That motherfucker is so big, the CEO, and she don't go for Tony Storm, and she don't go. I want. I want all the gold. I want everything. No, I have unfinished business with Willow because I got injured. I love Willow Nightingale. I rooted for her before she even signed with AEW. But Willow Nightingale is not this headliner. You could have a main event at Dynamite. You could have a main event at Pay-Per-View. You could have a main event. You could have 55 people on social media say, oh, AEW is finally taking the women seriously. For regular wrestling fans, we know better. We know what the mindset is. Will Ospreay comes in, cuts all these promos. He can't go for Samoa Joe because AEW waited too goddamn long for Swerve Strickland. Swerve Strickland should have gotten that belt in January or February at the latest. You ride the momentum. You feel the aura on social media. You feel the vibe. You go with your instinct. AEW has become a promotion that the matches that are being on TV, they're being put on TV because they believe that they're four star because they will be the greatest wrestling out there. I don't give a shit about El Hijo del Vikingo. I don't give a shit about Commander. I don't give a shit about uh, Shibata, Kawada, Takara, da da. AEW's never given, they don't build people up to feel larger than life. I hate comparing AEW to WWE, but you look at WWE and they put somebody out there and more times than not, they make you believe that that person is worth 10 times their value. And they put the jets behind people. And the ones that they don't, Cameron Grimes, Zia Lee, and you could go down the list. Unfortunately, not everybody could do it. I go, so just to answer his question, I don't want to get off track. Will Ospreay should have immediately gone for Samoa Joe. We can't do that. So Swerve Strickland still hasn't gotten to the promised land. They waited too long. 
Now, if Swerve still gets it now, it's fucking cool. If he gets it at AEW Dynasty, it's fucking awesome, finally. But AEW doesn't go with the hot hand. They go what they like, what their buddies in the back likes, what they feel is, you know, what should be out there. And they don't get a good vibe from the audience. The problem is, is they got a small core of people online that if Will Ospreay fought dog shit, people would say, you know what? You know, it, it was dog shit, but you know, Will Ospreay makes dog shit even look great. You know, people will, oh, Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson, they're having a feud because I think I could beat you. They have storylines. They're not intriguing. They're not intriguing. And you see the same template used over and over and over again. Okada comes in. Okada, arguably the best wrestler today. And they put him against Eddie Kingston. And they give him a belt that was three, that was, you know, some tournament thing. And even the belts don't feel like they mean shit. There's so many goddamn belts. Do I care? They want the perception that Okada's walking around with gold. Because he's one of the biggest stars. He's got to walk around with gold. Even if it was a butterfly championship that said Divas on it. So Okada should have went for Samoa Joe. Will Ospreay should have went for Samoa Joe. If Will, if Will Ospreay shows up and Okada wants Samoa Joe, then Will Ospreay goes after Okada and say, you know what, Whoever, whichever one of us comes on top, we take on Samoa Joe. Problem is, the... They played foreplay with Swerve Strickland for too fucking long. And because they didn't want Swerve to lose at the pay-per-view, and this is why I didn't order the pay-per-view. Soon as Hangman Page was put in it, I went on one of these shows and I said, ah, I'm not ordering it. I'm not, it's not that I don't want to order for one match, but I know that they put a Hangman Page in there because they don't want Samoa Joe to lose and they don't want Swerve Strickland to feel make people feel like he's being jobbed. Ever since the night, that NXT went up against AEW. And if I remember correctly, it might have been Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland. If I think that might have been the match. And I think Swerve lost. I don't remember what match it was, but it was a match that I know when the outcome happened. First of all, I think it might have been the opening match or it might have been the beginning of out. They didn't even close out the main event with it. But... I remember that night, and people were like, why didn't they give him the win? And it feels like they're giving Brian Dins, like Brian Dins to say, oh, I want a hair versus mask match against Mystico. He's turning into a child that found a daycare center that says, I want pasta for breakfast. Brian, you get it. I want ice cream for breakfast. Brian, you get it. I want a pound of jelly beans. Brian, you get it. I just ate dinner, but I want cupcakes for dinner, Brian. You get it. You know, it's like all the things that these people want, they're given. No, we didn't ask for it. But you'll get a core group of people online that'll be the loudest noise to convince you that, no, you really wanted it. You just didn't realize it. And if you say you don't want it, you're a hater, you're ignored, you're banished. So... How do you improve Mercedes Monet? How do you improve Okada? How do you improve Will Ospreay? Okada is a hard situation. And I honestly think, I, this might surprise some people, I honestly don't have much of a problem of him with the Young Bucks. Because the motherfucker is not out there speaking fluent English. Somebody's got to be a mouthpiece. And Don Callis, they have him with Takeshka. They have him with Hob. They got him with this person. They got him with that person. They got him with this person. You know, Okada should have a, a Paul Heyman, a special advocate. Now, you don't just grow Paul Heymans on trees. But when you bring Okada in, one of the first things is you don't say, oh, I got to have him. It's my, remember when I wrote on the synopsis three months ago, two months ago, that Tony Khan already has a verbal agreement with Okada, and that's his biggest sign ever. Mercedes Monet is not the biggest sign ever. Maybe 
as far as name value because of the WWE Universe. But for him, Okada is the biggest grab of his lifetime. But they never stop to think, okay, what do we do with Okada once he comes in? Oh, we'll just have him have five-star matches. But he can't talk. Who's going to be his mouthpiece? I mean, they never address this problem. So the young bucks are his mouthpiece right now. So how do you correct Okada? You have to fucking find someone to be his manager, his advocate, and just that one person, nobody else. He's got, you can't just have him go out there and have a four-star match and a five-star match and a four-star match. I, the rating was 747,000 and two of the matches on Dynamite this week, Dave Meltzer gave it four and a half stars. Now, I don't give a shit about match ratings and Dave Meltzer has every right to his opinion. I respect it, even though I don't agree with a lot of it. But when you look at the history of WrestleMania matches, some of the greatest ones that we have seen, and then you're going to tell me that, you know, Shibata versus Will Ospreay was ranked higher than mania matches and then you realize that not even 250,000 or 300,000 fans in the demo watched it that 100,000 changed the channel changed the channel while the match was on here's your proof here's your proof i know what some of you're going to say wait a minute dt you know the big bang theory lead and always has a uh, inflated number. Yeah, we were talking about that a year before Jim Cornette did, with all due respect. You know, everybody now, oh, let's, let's do the rating without the first quarter and without the overrun, and that's the true rating. Yeah, we were doing that 18 months ago. Okada, I mean, Osprey versus Shibata opened up with 939,000 viewers. While the match was on, they lost 130,000 people. So you had a whole bunch of big bangers that said, eh, I don't want to watch this match. I don't fucking know these people. Let me tune it out. But that wasn't enough. They had an Okada angle immediately after that, and they lost another 100,000 viewers. Did, 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 a whole, did an extra 100,000 from the Big Bang Theory fall asleep for a half hour? Was there, was there something in the water? So they lost 220,000 viewers in 30 minutes. And then by the time you get to the main event, you're looking at 672, 654, 658. And ain't no fucking way 70,000 wrestling fans decided, you know what, I'm going to watch a five-minute overrun. I'm going to watch a five-minute overrun, a four-minute overrun. If you have 50,000, 70,000 fans tuning in just for an extra five minutes after the show is supposed to go off the air, then your product sucks. You look at these ratings. You look at Mercedes Monet. You, while all this is going on, and then Tony Storm has her promo, and they lose 100,000 viewers. It's right on your screen. And they never came back. Let's go a week earlier. A week earlier, their numbers are much more consistent. This template for hour two that they did on March 20th is a much, much better template. Problem is, is that Christian Cage and Adam Copeland main eventing Dynamite happened because it was in Canada. But you see too many times AEW does not put the right main event to close out dynamite. They open up with it because they want to have that fo that false rating that oh Shibata drew a million viewers. And they open up the show and there's no explanation ever when 100,000 people tune out and then 50 to 100,000 more people tune out on the next quarter. And these are the biggest names. They open up with it thinking you could have Snoopy the dog, open up dynamite, humping somebody's leg and ejaculating on somebody's leg, and it'll still draw 900,000 viewers. They have the matches so out of proportion. And Copeland versus Christian, I forget about the fact that they were WWE Hall of Famers. They should be. 
Christian already should have been Hall of Famer. But they built that all night long because they were in Canada. They should be doing that every single week. Whoever main events, during those two hours, they should make you care and not just make you care that particular week. If Shabbat is going to main event in the near future, build that motherfucker up for a week, two weeks, a month. Let people start saying like, why do I care about Commander? Why do I care about fucking, you know, anybody you want to put out there? I look at their roster. Now let's go one week before. This was the Monet debut. Look at it. They want the Mercedes Monet to open up Dynamite. Instead of maybe building anticipation, hour two, hour three. Oh, no, it was a surprise. It was a surprise. No, big business with two dollar signs. S fucking somebody brain dead, mentally retarded, mentally deficient, in a vegetative state could have seen big business dollar signs, Boston. If they were a Sasha Banks fan and this was hyped for a month and Tony Khan with his drugged out eyes looking at the, 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 the thing that we... Big business will be the biggest event, the mo very important event in AEW history. And nobody fucking knew. What happened the following week? What happened the following week? No bump. The first week that Mercedes debuted, what did people say? Oh, nobody knew. They didn't advertise it. Nobody knew. What's the excuse for the second week when the rating went down, albeit at just a thousand? Now what's the excuse? Mercedes Monet should have walked in there and start fucking with Tony Storm, start fucking with Julie Hart, start fucking with everybody on that women's roster. She should have come in as a monster heel that her shit don't stink. Make her feel that I, I'm. she's only there because she took Tony Khan's purse, took all the money. That's not good enough. I want all the gold as well. I Not only do I want Tony Khan's money, I want all the gold also. She should be going for champions. Not, oh, I haven't finished business with Willow. Imagine if she fucking gets injured again in the match with Willow. That's how you repair Mercedes, Okada, and Osprey. These motherfuckers should be going for champions. The biggest dogs in the yard, the biggest stars in that company. Not, you know, Julie, Sky. Willow, Chris Statlander. They've done gots with Chris Statlander ever since Jake Cargill left. This, this, that's how you fix all three of them. Make us feel that these motherfuckers want to be the, the center. They want to be the top of the mountain. They want to lead AEW. Not be an ant. Mercedes Monet is too, in my opinion, too young to be an ant for the women's division. Tony Khan has a couple of exotic cars and don't know how to drive a stick. That's the problem. Sorry for the extended rant. I know this was a big topic of conversation the last week. Those ratings could be repaired. They need to shift the matches around. They need to stop with this mindset that you put the biggest names at the beginning of the show because you know you're going to get a false number. I got news for you. Warner Brothers Media, Warner Media, they ain't stupid. When they see this five-minute overrun and they see this Big Bang lead-in, when negotiations come, you think they sit at the table and like, you know, your opening and your close are always really, really strong. We just have to work on the, you know, those quarters in between. They ain't stupid. They ain't stupid. What they do with that, that's like me gaining weight. And to make myself come across that I lost weight, I take my manual scale and I turn it back three pounds. So it's actually three notches before the zero. And then I go on the scale, look, I lost a pound. Build anticipation. People don't have to wrestle every week. But stop with the same format. 
cuts promo, confrontation, goes on commentary, cuts promo, confrontation, finally has a squash match, teases match on pay-per-view, match is over, cuts another promo, random person shows up in the back, random person shows up in the rampway. Then the following week, that person is on commentary, confrontation, it's the same fucking shit over and over again. Now this week, Don Callis is on con. Stop with the fucking people on commentary. Nobody cares. Nobody tunes in because I'm going to hear somebody talking. I want to see them fucking in the ring. I want to see them tell a strong story. I want to care. I want to give a shit. They have storylines. They're not intriguing. I don't care that somebody wants to beat somebody. You know, all right. Enough. Enough. All right. Let's... Get on over to Mikey Ravello. Thank you, Mikey. WWE, WWE reported that Bray Wyatt won't be put in the WWE Hall of Fame this year. What happened? Uh, I have uh, some answers for you. And believe it or not, Mike Rotunda, his father, actually gave some of the answers away this week. Um, I was convinced Bray Wyatt was going to the Hall of Fame this year. That's because I'm a wrestling fan. Bray Wyatt was my favorite wrestler in the last 10 years. You know, I think a lot of you remember how much, you know, I broke down. My favorite wrestler of all time and my favorite wrestler in the last 10 years both died in the same week. Sucks. Believe it or not, I still keep. This is a letter Terry Funk wrote to me when I got engaged. I keep Daphne plate by my thing. I keep little letters over here, I look down and it means a lot to me. I keep little things around my area that mean a lot to me. Um, so as a wrestling fan, I want to celebrate Bray Wyatt. I'm not going to the Hall of Fame, but I want to see that. And Philly, you felt perfect place. But Mike Rotunda, his father, talked to Bill Apter. Bill Apter, very well respected. Bill Apter has covered Mike Rotunda's entire wrestling career, spanned four decades, five decades, whatever it is. And Bray Wyatt was brought up. Mike Rotunda basically summed it up like this. It'll be less stressful if Bray Wyatt's not put in the Hall of Fame this soon. Do you remember a couple of months ago, I said that if the family is not ready to put him in the Hall of Fame, he's not going in. This was more of Triple H taking the incentive to tell the family, look, you know, it's a little too soon. The family felt the same way, that it's a little too soon. It's still very, very raw. It's going to be like that for years. For that family... That pain never goes away. You just try to learn to accept it. You know, unfortunately, death comes sometimes when you least expect it. Family members, friends, pets, people you admire. And for Bray Wyatt, came the age of 36. But that's why Bray Wyatt is not going in the Hall of Fame this year. It is less stressful for the family. It's less stressful for the Rotundas, the Wyndhams, JoJo, the kids, you know, close friends. Next year, different story. But Bray Wyatt will not be put in the Hall of Fame this year. And as a wrestling fan, if I want to be selfish, I'll say that sucks. But because I am such a Bray Wyatt fan, I respect the family. I respect the decision. And I have no problem with it whatsoever. I would have loved to have that documentary and the announcement go hand in hand. But this year, Hall of Fame will not be happening. So, but I'm so looking forward to that documentary. Sticky Fingers Frank. Thank you, Sticky. Did I hear the shot Dana Brooke took at Tiffany Stratton? Oh, I sure did. Oh, I sure did. Um, Honestly, for those that don't know, Dana Brooke called Tiffany Stratton a Bobby ripoff 
or Barbie wannabe, and she rips off other people's wrestling moves. Um, I, I'm trying to be so nice about Dana Brooke. I almost feel like she's trying to be a heel right now. Um, Tiffany Stratton uh, did not invent the moonsault. Uh, Dana Brooke did not invent any wrestling moves either. Uh, Dana Brooke, her offense, her finishers, someone else did before her too. Um, Tiffany Stratton being a rich Barbie blonde chick. Duh. Duh. Do you see the promo on SmackDown tonight? Her by the pool and bringing up, um, who did she bring up? Oh, Paris Hilton. I think she did. She, Somebody like that. Yeah, I mean, I followed NXT. I followed her entire NXT run when she was green as grass. You know, it, it, early on, it felt like, you know, r privileged kid, brat. If you ever watch those police videos, the DWI arrests and privileged teen who's never been told no before. How many of you watch? I binge watch it every week on YouTube. I watch DWI arrests and I watch all these little teen girls, 18 years old, 22 years old. And the title's always the same teen girl. Never been told. No is told. No. And like, Oh, that's going to be fun. When the cop says license and registration, please get out of the car. No, I'm not getting out of the car, ma'am. Get out of the car. No, I don't feel comfortable. You're making me feel uncomfortable. Don't touch me. How many of you seen that? Tiffany Stratton early on came across. Can I call my daddy? Can I call my daddy? My daddy works in the police department, you know. That's what Tiffany Stratton came across early on. And as her character developed and she started to improve, her character morphed and it tweaked. And Tiffany Stratton is a, is a very talented, taking her in-ring career very seriously. So Dana Brooke taking a shot at her. Uh, I think it's just Dana Brooke trying to be like a jerk in character. She can't be that stupid and she can't be that serious about it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, if and, and honestly, if I'm Tiffany Stratton, I don't even acknowledge her. Whether it was an attempt to just be in character as a heel in TNA or if she legitimately has a gripe with Tiffany Stratton, if I'm Tiffany Stratton, don't even acknowledge her. Act like she don't even exist. So, okay. Bernard. What's up, Bernard? DT, would you agree that WWE right now is what AEW was supposed to be five years ago? Instead, we get a Japanese wrestling fetish that does nothing for you. Not everything is Japanese wrestling in AEW. I mean, you know, let's let's look at this past well, that's the 20th. Let's 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 look at this past Wednesday. All right, Shibata and Osprey open it up. Okada. All right, right now we got a heavy Japanese influence, but now we got private party, we got the Young Bucks, uh Swerve Strickland, a little Takeshka, that's okay. Darby Allen, who's injured with a broken foot. Jericho, Hook, Willow Nightingale, Chris Statlander, Anna J. Sky Blue, Dustin Rhodes, The Butcher. You know, you go down the list, there's not as much of a Japanese influence as you think. It's just, I use that as an example because you got to remember where Tony Khan came from. Tony Khan grew up the Ring of Honor stuff, grew up with the New Japan stuff, grew up in that mindset that it's about good in-ring wrestling. You could have the greatest matches, the greatest technical rap matches. There's a reason why Ring of Honor always drew 600 fans. You know, unless it was WrestleMania weekend, for years and years and years, Ring of Honor drew 600, 700. Once in a blue moon, 1,000 fans. You look at companies like GCW and others now, they fucking blow away what Ring of Honor used to draw. And remember, Ring of Honor had their Adam Coles, their Hangman Page, their CM Punks, their Brian Danielsons, the Kevin Steens, the El Genericos. Yeah, this was before they really made it big. 
But the point is, you know, Ring of Honor always boasted the best wrestling. But, you know, for, for decades, the majority of fans, there's got to be a balance. Sports entertainment. Got news for you. When you see these luchadors doing this mindless offense in AEW, that's sports entertainment. When you have, you know, said person just punching and chopping each other back and forth and back and forth and just doing it over and over again, you look at fucking, uh, oh, um, oh, I'm drawing up. Minoru Suzuki. Minoru Suzuki. You look at his matches. That is 1,000% sports entertainment. The problem is they think if we perceive AEW as sports entertainment, that it's WWE ripoff, it's WWE light, that wrestlers leave WWE because they want to take their in-ring careers a little more seriously. AEW is just as much sports entertainment as WWE is, but they insist on having matches with no build, and because they're a good match on paper, we all have to tune in. It is must-see. There's a reason why off-Broadway plays only draw 300 people. And those actors might be more talented than the Hollywood actors that are on Broadway that draw 10,000 people. So there's a reason why Ring of Honor always drew low. Because just depending on wrestling, you know, more than anything else, they, they refuse to admit. And here's another thing, too. You know, when you see interviews outside of AEW, I watched Swerve do an interview with um, Vic Joseph's wife, Mackenzie Mitchell, uh, earlier today. I love the interview. But, you know, Swerve is talking about Edge and calling him by that and talking about other things, and which is fine. But Swerve comes off so classy, so cool, so professional, so likable. Even if he's a heel, you respect what he does. And you don't see the people behind the scenes in AEW that have built a really awful foundation. You know, you look at the, 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 the executives, the EVPs, you look at, I don't want to name any other wrestlers, but, you know, the ones that are fit into that mold backstage. And you look at a lot of those guys, even the young guys that are good friends with all those people, and you never see these people doing interviews outside of the company, like just given a reason like why, you know, this is more than just Tony Khan's playground. I know it's, you know, because Bischoff says it now and this person says it now that, oh, look, Bischoff said it's like a kid with toys. And motherfucker, we were saying that shit three and a half years ago. You know, it's just, you don't see the right people doing interviews and giving a little bit more of a reason. Like, they just shun it off. And now because of the CM Punk stuff, that they try to turn it in storyline, and it's just not working. It's not working. The Young Bucks, you know, you. this is why you need a general manager in AEW also. You know, when you have people committing atrocities on TV, and Tony Khan is nowhere to be found. He's outside buying ice cream. He's got the munchies after lighting up. You know, but someone else, you know, this behavior is unacceptable, or this and that. And then, to and then Tony Schiavone, and, and I'm hearing in my ear that this match is going to happen, and it's not even 10 seconds later. You know, it's they need a general manager. They have to enforce some laws. Once in a while, a DQ is necessary. Spoiling someone's momentum is necessary. Fucking someone's match up. When everybody does a run-in, nobody does a run-in. When the referees are just there to count the pin and everything else is ignored, then it doesn't mean much. I was, I'll bring this up. I know nobody super shouted this, but I'm going to bring it up here. The big question that I was asked Monday night and on Patreon, and I'll answer it here before anybody asks, is WWE attitude back? 
Is TV 14 back? Props to everybody who is a Hall of Famer, promoter, manager, wrestler, who jerked everybody off the last five days saying that WWE Attitude is back, that PG is gone. If you think a little blood and The Rock getting censored, saying the word fuck, which was planned, by the way, if you think that that suddenly means that Attitude is back, oh boy, you better not watch WWE two weeks after WrestleMania, three weeks after WrestleMania. Um, I'm not going to get into a lecture, but I'll answer it in a very, very simple, logical way. And please, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's fun. I, I want to make this clear. I truthfully believe when WWE goes to Netflix, it'll be a different story. You will see more adult-oriented content or content suitable for older viewers. This will intertwine with Netflix. A year ago, some of your most esteemed journalists all broke breaking major, unbelievable, pay for my news. Starting this Monday, WWE will be TV 14. And everybody's like, oh, Attitude Era is back. Finally, WWE gets rid of PG, PG. Oh, they got TV. For Remember that a, a, a little over a year ago? TV 14, coming back this Monday on Raw. I happen to get lucky. I was doing a show about an hour after that broke. And I came up here and I said, guys, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's fun. There ain't no fucking way they go on TV 14, going back to TV 14 on Monday. And everybody was like, why are you so sure? DT, what makes you so sure? And I gave you the answer. WWE is a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. If you are going to change the rating of your television show, not only do you have to clear it with the networks, you have to clear it with the advertisers. You have to clear it with the stockholders. You have to clear it with the investors. There are a lot of people that invest big money in that company because they believe it's fan friendly and they believe that, you know, ticket sales, merchandise, viewerships, it, it trickles down to young audiences. And if you're going to suddenly turn your product where kids can no longer see for responsible parents out there or they can no longer hear because WWE's going TV 14, there is a crazy number of people that have to be informed first. And that was never done. If you noticed back then, and I pointed it out, not one person in the business world ever reported that WWE was going back to TV 14. Not Forbes, not Yahoo News, wherever you want to go. Not one non-wrestling site reported it. If WWE were to go to TV 14, this would be a major story in the business world because that changes the landscape of the advertisers, the investors, the stockholders. You could see a huge increase in the stock, you could see a huge drop in the stock because, oh, they're going to lose that kid-friendly audience. Now, you and me, we like vulgarity. We like blood. We like a chair shot to the head once in a while. We like that. But you have to look at it in a broader scope. Didn't believe it, and what happened? They were fucking wrong. Same thing now. They did it at 10 58 p.m. Guys, they did it outside of prime time. That's why they were able to do it on Monday. They waited until almost 11 o'clock to do it. They didn't even say earlier in the night that Cody was going to bleed. People read lips and reported online. The Rock whispered to Cody, tonight you're going to bleed. They couldn't even say it earlier. They're not bringing back TV 14 and attitude just because one week you got a little blood at 10.58 p.m. and The Rock dropped an F-bomb that was censored 
outside of the live audience. My friends, since when is a TV PG movie not allowed to have blood? I mean, any movie you watch, yes, it's fake blood. You watch Rocky movies, you watch horror movies, whether it's on ABC TV, USA Network, TBS, Turner Classic Movies, NBC, 8 o'clock p.m., 9 o'clock p.m. You're telling me you never watched a movie on any of those networks between 8 and 10 p.m. that was PG and had blood? You never had one with blood? Cody bleeds a little and everybody's like, no, that's TV 14. Why? Why is it TV 14? Because people want it to be. There is no, don't say it's never coming back. Netflix, different animal. And I'll tell you in a minute why. You know, understand this. I'm an old guy now. I'm an old guy. I don't reminisce watching wrestling during the Attitude Era as much as I used to. But understand, the Attitude Era is arguably 20 years ago. Because around 05, 06, that's when things really started to change. About 20 years ago. If you want to go further, 25 years ago. 1999, Attitude was in full force. It's 25 years ago, Attitude was around. Look at wrestling fans today who are under the age of 40 or 35. Use 35. If they were alive 25 years ago and they're under the age of 35, that means they were the oldest nine years old, maybe 10. I don't know other than grammar school. I mean, we used to hear on the news that Kid got suspended because he walked into his classroom and go, hey, Dr. Smith, suck it, suck it. You know, kids would complain. I remember Mick Foley. I wouldn't let my kids watch this product. You know, up until mid-2000s, attitude was in full force. There is a major group of fans out there that never experienced attitude. You could watch it on the WWE Network. You could watch YouTube videos. You could watch shoot interviews of wrestlers that lived through it. You could watch wrestlers today that are 20 years past their prime that were big in the Attitude Era. The fact of the matter is there is a huge group of people out there that never experienced Attitude that want to experience Attitude. That's why, just like the Monday Night Wars, the Monday Night Wars ended 23 years ago. You want to go back to 2020, which is a fair time to do it. That was 19 years after the Monday Night Wars ended. So if you were a 30-year-old AEW fan in 2020, that means you were 11 in 2001. A boatload of fans that never got to experience the Monday Night Wars other than watching documentaries needed it, wanted it, wanted to feel it. When we used to channel surf back and forth, back and forth, who's this person's going to jump to this place? This person's a free agent. Will he sign with WCW? Will he sign with the WWF? You know, there's a, a lot of people never experienced it. So they insisted that NXT and AEW Dynamite was the Wednesday Night War. I played into it because everybody was acknowledging as a war. Even the responsible reporters out there always would tell you, NXT, demo, quarter hour, versus AEW, demo, quarter hour. This went up to this. This went up against this. And it was so fucking unfair to see somebody in NXT who has three matches under their belt going up against Hangman Page versus whoever. And like, oh, look, AEW trounced NXT. 944 to 617. And that's like me saying that the Yankees beat the double-A Yankees. People insisted that Wednesdays were a war because they never experienced it. You have a boatload of people out there right now 
And I totally understand why. You realize now, WWE's been good for a while. You don't need TV 14 for it to be good. But you realize by seeing a little bit of blood with Cody Rhodes and hearing a censored F-bomb, you realize how much the WWE became restricted over the last 15 years because of the publicly traded company, because of the family-friendly entertainment. You understand now that with AEW, you get blood every week. At one point, John Moxley had an addiction, and it wasn't alcohol. It was blood. You could have curses every single week on AEW. You want blood and cursing that bad, you could watch it every week right now in wrestling. But you do it in WWE, Attitude Era is back. Those people are not that stupid, my friends. People playing up to this the last five days just wanted to use you for revenue. WWE is not, is not going to go TV 14 now and bring back Attitude unless advertisers, networks, stockholders, investors, fan, across the board are informed of it beforehand. We are leading into WrestleMania. You know, 10.59 p.m., 10.58 p.m., seeing a little blood. You know, that's like your grandmother. You know, your mother says no cookies before dinner. I'm like, oh, come on, ma. And then your grandma's like, God, take one. Take one. Nobody, shh. Just don't ask for any more, but shh. That's what this was. This was a cookie to help build up the seriousness of WrestleMania. You were reminded how fucking restricted WWE is because of where they are. But, but, there's light at the end of the tunnel. When they go to Netflix, you will see the effect of TKO Group Holdings now holding, now owning WWE, Endeavor now owning WWE. You will see that in full force. When the deal was first made, a lot of you said to me, DT, what do you think is going to be different on TV? What do you think is going to change? And I said, for now, nothing, nothing. Why rock the boat if everything is going well? You really didn't see much. You saw a little subtleties. You see a little bit more of violence. You see a little bit more physicality in matches. You see a little bit more common sense. I loved it tonight. I loved it tonight. Up until maybe a year ago, if Logan Paul rolled out from under the ring, hit Kevin Owens with brass knucks, and then hid back under the ring, that would be the end of it. Then we would go to the back, and Kayla Braxton would be interviewing somebody. But this time around... They use common sense. Triple H is using common sense now. Why wouldn't we see a replay on the, on the screen? Randy Orton sees that Logan Paul went back under the ring. How many times, how many times have any of you ever been to a WWE house show or pay-per-view or Raw or SmackDown and you're watching a match and somebody cheats, and you're yelling at the referee, turn around, turn around, look. And the referee don't turn around. Or you're telling the other wrestler, you're like, he's got something, and they act like, no, me no speak English. No, me no, no, no hable English. So they act like they don't hear you, and you're just yelling and yelling, and you're like, fuck. Now they use common sense. Now all the fans are ringside. Randy, he's under the ring. Lifts it up, goes after Logan Paul. Can't hide under the ring anymore. Using common sense. You know, even stuff you see on social media, stuff you see with promos. You know, you see little digs. You know, people made such a big deal about CM Punk teasing Drew McIntyre like, who told you you were the chosen one? Who told you the chosen one? You know, CM Punk was not trying to get Drew McIntyre to say Vince McMahon. But the obvious is there, and we all know it. We know the deal. They don't want to insult your intelligence like they used to before. 
That is something that has changed. But understand who owns WWE now. Understand that WWE built up to a $10 billion company based on what they've been doing. TKO comes in or Endeavor comes in and they, there's a reason why they bought it at that price. WWE, whether you like Kevin Dunn, whether you like Vince McMahon, whether you like whatever, you know, whatever happened up to that point, there's a reason why it was valued at that. You don't come in there and say, we're going to shake it up. No. If you're making that much coin, why would you change a damn thing about it? Problem is, TV deals are coming up. And now, USA Network paid for SmackDown. Nah, we can't pay for Raw also. Now, Netflix is taking Raw. And Netflix is paying them, what, billions? So, what happens? Netflix... The advertisers are much different. You're not going to get, you know, iced tea selling car shield all the time. You know, woo, car shield. You know, you're not going to get the commercials. Oh, you know, my grandmother, she's got Alzheimer's, but she takes this drug and now she could go cave diving. You ever see those commercials? Like somebody is like stricken with some awful illness and they take something. And then suddenly they're bike riding, they're climbing mountains, they're running marathons. And it's always like 15 different nationalities. Like every nationality is together. And it's all everything, a perfect world. And then you hear the side effects. Side effects include heart attack, stroke, cancer, tumors, emphysema. You know, don't take it unless you've did. But um, the advertiser is going to be totally different. Netflix, all hands are off. All gloves are off. So you could very well get TV 14 on Netflix because if Netflix's advertising audience, if their target audience is adult, you could have kids complaining. You could have parents complaining. You still got USA Network and SmackDown. USA Network is not going to change what they're doing now. Their advertising structure is the same. So even if... Raw is a little bit edgier, it'll probably be that third hour. So you will get edgier content on Netflix because they're paying this kind of money. And if you ever follow ad, you know, commercials and what Netflix is proposing, they they will allow more. But TKL's not stupid. If investors are not happy with the decision, if they feel that Becoming TV 14 is damaging their all. You will see that go right back to the format it is now. You have to look at it in the business perspective and not just as a wrestling fan. If it was up to me, you and me have everything TV 14. You know, it's, it's a violent product. What are we watching? Simulated violence. You know, you don't see two people in the ring having thumb wrestling, you know, just having fun chicken fights. You're not seeing people playing tag, you know, dodgeball. This is vi simulated violent shit. You know, I punch you, you punch me, I kick you, I choke you out. It's simulated violence. So don't buy into what you saw this week. If you want to suspend your disbelief and have some fun and fantasize that it could happen by all means, but two, three weeks after WrestleMania, don't say I didn't tell you so. NXT Bobby cannot be TV 14 either. Cause it's CW network. Plus why would you take your minor league system and make them edgy like that? You could do it on their premium live events, but you know, you're trying to broaden that. Look at Fox. Look at Fox. Let me ask you guys something. You don't have to answer, but think about this for a minute. You watch raw. I know it's three hours instead of two. That third hour is very painful. I feel your pain. You look at raw for three hours. 
and you look at SmackDown for two hours. Is it much different? Do you feel that one is much more violent than the other? Do you feel one is a little bit more vulgar than the other? Forget the Rock Cody stuff. This is special. This is leading to mania. But overall, does the product feel different? No. Do you ever watch when Raw first goes on the air? When you hear John Cena go, then. Woo! If you smell. You ever look in the corner of the rating? On the USA Network, it says TVPG and a big V for violence. That's all it shows. Look at the intro, the opening for any Raw, and you will see in the corner Vince McMahon Sr.'s face will pop up, and you will see TV, PG, with the letter V. That's it. Now you go to Fox, SmackDown, Friday nights like tonight. What, what do you see on the opening? You see TV, PG, violence, language, dialogue, something else. There's four right, ratings. Pretty much the same format, same product, different wrestlers. Why is one just the V for violence? And the other one is dialogue. And this, uh, because Fox is regular network television. It's not cable. CW, same setup. That's why on CW, don't be surprised if you see V, L, D, you know, instead of just the letter V because it's network television. All right. How long have we been going? We've been going 80 minutes already. Wow. Time flies. So let's start bringing this home a little bit because we got a big week coming up. We have uh, Monday's Raw. By the way, the first hour will be commercial free. So shit's going to be going down in hour one. Uh, next week, Jey Uso's taking on Solo Sokoa. Which is interesting because that means that for three hours on Raw Monday, they're not going to spend too much time on Jey Uso. Um, Zelina Vega taking on, uh, who is she taking on? Um, Electra Lopez next week. That's going to lead into a, a messy clusterfuck. I, I am still holding out hope that that tag match with Ray and Dragon Lee versus Dom and Santos. The only thing is, what do you think Santos Escobar would look like shaved? Completely shaved head. Does Andrade get involved in that match? Don't you feel like Andrade gets involved? Problem is, if Andrade gets involved, he's not a SmackDown. How many of you out there, when Ray announced tonight that it was going to be a new member of the LWO, how many of you out there thought it was going to be Andrade? I actually was holding out hope that it was Andrade, but it was Dragon Lee. And that's fine. I mean, they, you know, Dragon Lee is a very talented guy. Getting the rub from Ray is a good thing, but I'm hoping that they add that stipulation to it. I really do. Mark Hicks says bloodline era. Um, I, I see people trying to push that Renaissance era thing. Don't. It is that is premature ejaculation, guys. L wait till they go to Netflix. Give it a month, then we could talk. Renaissance era. It's that's because they think that it's going back to what it. You no, know, no, not good. Yeah, this week is WrestleMania already. It's kind of wild that literally in seven days, we will have night one and night two of WrestleMania. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I just hope, you know, five years from now, we don't look back at this mania and we only remember, I mean, we'll remember more matches, obviously, but the ones everybody will be talking about, are obviously the three maybe just the two, but, you know, Drew and Seth is going to be a big deal. I'm, like I said earlier today, I'm kind of feeling we might see a failed cash-in by Damian Priest. Damian Priest said something tonight on SmackDown. By the way, that segment was pre-recorded for Monday. The Judgment Day, as far as I know, we're not at SmackDown tonight. But when, when Damian Priest said that 
you know, the WrestleMania is not about one person. It's kind of like gave, gives me Survivor Series vibes. Do you remember when Rhea Ripley, you know, we she teased that Damian Priest was going to cash in and his cash in was sabotaged? You know, Survivor Series felt like Damian Priest tried to turn it into, you know, about him. And obviously he never cashed in, but I think that could very well happen again for WrestleMania. In a failing effort, too. Byron says damage control versus Jay Cargill, Bianca Belair, and Naomi should be a six-woman elimination tag team last women standing match. That sounds like an AEW. That is when you got when it takes that many words, it probably shouldn't be. Look, um, we talked about it on Monday. So tonight we pretty much got this cemented. I don't know how I feel that the Kabuki Warriors are not defending their tag titles at WrestleMania, it gives you an idea of how bad the women's tag team division is in the WWE right now. But my God, Jay Cargill looked tremendous tonight. You could see when you truly have a diamond in the rough, whether she was green as grass or whether she was already sprouting, but you wanted to make sure that she flourished exactly the way you wanted her to. Her presentation, her presence in the ring, even the main event tonight, Bianca Belair beats Dakota Kai immediately after the Kabuki Warriors hit the ring, attacking Bianca, Naomi's music hits. She gets laid out also. And all you hear the fans go, Jade, Jade, Jade. So they knew it. And then here comes Jade Cargill. Yes, if you really want to nitpick, every member of the, of Damage Control was waiting while she laid out one person. If you look, she laid out Dakota Kai and Oscar's standing there waiting. And then Oscar tried to nail Jade Cargill and Jade Cargill lays her out. And meanwhile, uh, uh, what's her face? Um, Kyrie Sane is standing in the corner just waiting, and then she gets laid out. But Jay Cargill looked like a million dollars tonight. And yes, you will see nothing wrong with it, but you will see a boatload of people, three powerful black women teaming up at WrestleMania, and that's fine. I look at them as just three very strong, talented women against three very talented women. Um, I don't like that the Kabuki Warriors are not defending the tag titles, but this is Jay Cargill's introduction. Yes, in a six-woman tag, but it's her true introduction. The spotlight's going to be on her. There's going to be a lot of pressure. I'm still surprised she's not taking on Nia Jax. Really surprised at that. You kind of feel that there was unfinished business there. Who knows? Maybe Nia Jax does show up. Maybe after the match is over, Nia Jax shows up and maybe Jay Cargill lays her out. Hey, we do have Raw wrestlers wrestling on SmackDown once in a while. We've had LA Knight wrestle on Raw way before WrestleMania season. So there's no reason why we can't down the line have Jay Cargill versus Nia Jax for a week. Tristan is asking me my thoughts on Bandana, Vin, Vince McMahon. He was just making a mockery out of ECW. He made a mockery about ECW. It was just stupid. Did not like it. It was stupid. Um, Bobby, could we get uh, Cody versus Orton and Drew versus Punk for the biggest party, SummerSlam? Well, I don't know if you tuned in to Monday, but Kevin and I think it's going to be Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre, and CM Punk. At, rest, at SummerSlam. CM Punk, barring any setbacks, should be good to go for SummerSlam. You know, a lot of people didn't believe Kevin and I when we said that Seth Rollins was going to return when we said he was, and he returned exactly on the schedule we said. Um, he doesn't have to get surgery. He's good to go. But SummerSlam is a lot closer than you think. You know, in less than a week, we're in April. You know, SummerSlam is, you know, what? four months away, 
You know, so you can very easily have Seth Rollins lingering in the title picture. Someone else could get involved with him, and that leads into like a little detour. But the amount of interaction that CM Punk had with Seth Rollins on Monday tells me that this will be a big deal later on in the year. I think we will get Seth versus Drew versus CM Punk for the World Heavyweight Championship at SummerSlam. And Randy Orton versus Cody Rhodes is definitely possible. That's another match, Kevin, I talked about on Monday. Definitely a match that is possible. Uh, Randy Orton turning heel? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, Randy's an awesome heel, so I don't think anybody will complain but, uh, yeah, we see Randy Orton win an RKO out of nowhere to Cody Rhodes. So, a lot of love for Jade Cargill tonight. Listen, I'm not going to trash AEW's usage of Jade Cargill. AEW, you got to realize that when you're spending that kind of coin as a brand new company, they don't, they don't have the luxury of having her in their NXT nightmare factory for two years, honing her skills, becoming, I honestly, and I'm saying this 100% sincere, I think AEW did a great job with Jay Cargill only because of how limited she was. Yes, they were sloppy about it. She brought up how, you know, they wanted her to use a chair and no one even taught her how to use the chair. Like CM Punk had to show her. But my point is to throw her out in the fire like that and without having that luxury of her training for six months or a year in the minor leagues first, you know, they did a good job hiding her, you know, her her inexperience. It came out. Unfortunately, when you fight someone like a, a Taya Valkyrie, she is so polished and so established that she can't pull back that much so somebody inexperienced could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. You know, she was going, and it just, if you notice, Jay Cargill's worst matches were against very established women. If you think back, I think she fought Madison Rain. That was awful. She fought, uh, I think, didn't she fight Ruby Soul once or twice? And that was not very good. Like most of her matches that were really bad were against very talented women because those women are expecting more. Look at Goldberg. When Goldberg was in WCW, Goldberg's worst matches were against some of the greatest wrestlers that WCW had because they only know one speed. And Goldberg, you know, with his inexperience, could not keep up. Steven Regal, William Regal, we remember that match clearly. You see some of, look, you see recently, like some video came out of Goldberg with, I think, Meng and the Barbarian. And even though they, was, they were brutes they still could work a lot of goldberg's horrible shit in wcw was usually against really really good wrestlers because they were doing their thing and goldberg could not keep up michael is asking which hogan mania feud did i like more macho man warrior or andre uh Hogan Andre was a big deal. You know, the match itself, work rate wasn't much, obviously. It wasn't supposed to be. But it was a big deal because I grew up an Andre the Giant fan. My grandmother adored Andre the Giant. We saw him live and in person. Andre the Giant was one of the most friendly, beloved people around. And to have him turn heel... You know, my, my grandmother was alive at that time and she fucking hated him for, for that. So there was an emotional deal behind it. Um, so when he fought Hulk at WrestleMania three, believe me, I know people want to try to convince you otherwise, but,
but they didn't draw 93,000 fans because Steamboat was taken on Randy Savage. It was a great fucking match and it stole the show. But even that build, there was a lot of goofiness with George the Animal Steel. I always loved him, but, you know, the stuff with him and Elizabeth, there was more Saturday Night's main event stuff. It was not looked at as, you know, co-main event or anything like that. Uh, to me, of the three, Hogan Macho Man was probably the one that felt the biggest for me. You know, just as far as both guys, the mega powers, I still remember it. The mega powers explode. Uh, Warrior was great because I was rooting for Warrior. But probably Hogan Savage was the most. Im Hogan Andre was the biggest one. But Hogan Savage was the one that I really wanted to see them go at it. Stone Mexican guy likes the thumbnail. You know, I, I don't know if you heard my rant a little bit earlier. I'm not making fun of AEW. I'm, I offered criticism, but I offered or I also offered opinion on how I think they can make things better. I want to see AEW's numbers go up. I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect people out there that do these podcasts. I, I, watch Bischoff stuff. I watch Vince Russo's. I watch everybody else's. I watch Cornette's every day, but it is pretty fucking obvious that a boatload of those guys, uh, make a hell of a lot more money when AEW is not doing a great job. Although I think it was very, very stupid on Tony Khan's part, to take a dig at Eric Bischoff because he, John Albert announced that they were ending 83 weeks. I thought that was stupid, very stupid. Um, he's got a personal issue with Eric Bischoff um, to like be happy of somebody shutting something down. You know, I think with Tony Khan totally misfired, he, Tony, Eric Bischoff was not shutting down 83 weeks because it was a failure. He was shutting down 83 weeks so he could build on other projects, make more money. It's not just about, you know, what he thinks. He thinks that Eric Bischoff failed, so he was celebrating, oh, the quicker that, you know, abomination stops, the better for wrestling. You know, and then he's saying, oh, oh, uh, it's good that it's ending before the AEW, you know, the next TV deal. What does he think? Bischoff's not going to talk about it? Just, and listen, I said this three years ago. I'm going to say it again now. I want to punch my TV screen every time I hear, even though they don't say it as much anymore, every time I hear a Brian Last or Jim Cornette or Vince Russo or Conrad or anybody else that says, you know, Tony Khan, he's, he's a nice guy. He just, you know, he's got to just understand that he's got too much on his plate and, you know, he needs to hand the book to somebody else. Stop that shit. This motherfucker knows exactly what he's doing. He has been around for decades as a wrestling fan, a message board guy, a cage match guy, a Meltzer guy. He's the one that, you know, it was one of those Ring of Honor bots at the time that despised the WWE machine that believed in New Japan and the handshakes and all this other stuff. They ain't nothing, you know, innocent or naive about him. You know, I don't know why there's this, like, pity about him. He knows what he's fucking doing. He ain't retarded. He ain't fucking brain dead. He's not immature like he doesn't understand. He's got all this money and... I got my money. I do what I want with it. If I want to fucking lose 10, 20, 30, a hundred million dollars, that's all right. I got 9 billion left in the bank. He can do whatever he wants with it. You know, it's these guys make more money when AEW fails. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. And that's why when I offer solutions, it doesn't get much play because people want to see the dirt. They want to see the negativity. So, so my thumbnail is to, you know, be a little creative with the, with the words, you know, but, um, I, I always love Walt Clyde Frazier. 
Anybody know uh, Walt Frazier from the Knicks? Commentator used to do the Just for Men commercials with Keith Hernandez. No play for Mr. Gray. Walt Frazier, when he did commentary for the Knicks, he was one of the reasons why I used to watch the Knicks because he would always rhyme. He, you know, when you hear Ric Flair go style and profile or you hear a superstar Billy Graham from the 70s, you know, doing his thing. Walt Frazier was doing that shit also. And he and that's where I get that from. I don't get it from a wrestling person. I like playing on words. When I want to bring a point across, I always look for rhymes or look for something. To, but you know, I'm I don't want to see AEW only do seven forty seven. You game changers. That's that's understand all these people that are talking about this shit now, offering their solutions are those same ones that said Mercedes game changer. That's it. AEW is going to go to the next level. On um, um, what? Mars? On um, planet Mars? That's where you could go global. Go to Mars. All right. Let's take three more questions since it's getting a little late. It's getting late early here. And it's easy, it is Easter weekend. I want to wish everyone a happy Easter who celebrates it. I will be celebrating with family this weekend. Um, my birthday was two days ago, spent it with family, but we are getting together again. Next week is my wife's birthday. So we're taking her out and we got WrestleMania as well. So it's going to be a lot, a lot of content next week. We will definitely not overload everyone. Uh, we understand that everybody and their grandmother is going to have podcasts coming out and everything. So we're going to try to stick, you know, to those points in hand and, you know, not, you know, we're going to try to put two pounds of bologna in a one pound bag, but uh, we're going to definitely uh, have the show Monday. And again, I will let everybody know early Monday about the start time. As of right now, we're starting normal time, not 1215, but I will confirm that with Kev tomorrow and I'll let everybody know. And, you know, my apologies for anybody that shows up an hour late on Monday. Luckily, we'll record everything, so you'll be able to get the replay. So, who hasn't answered a question yet? Byron Cutler, the current WrestleMania 40 stage looks like it's going to be Philadelphia Towers. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a Philly influence to it. Listen, even though there's going to be a tremendous out of state, out of country, you know, you know, presence there, at the core, it's still Philly. And believe me, there is a huge load of Northeast fans going. I know so many people that are going. I actually talked to my wife last week. I said, you want to like spur the moment go? And she's like, what are we going to do with Bella? And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, so we were actually for a split second thinking, because we could go and, you know, we would have gotten press you know, thanks to a couple of people that work behind, you know, work for WWE. Me and Kev considered doing a little get together over there, but he's got a work part of that weekend. And me, it's a little crazy over here. So it's not happening this year. But uh, now there will be a Philly feel to this. Absolutely. There'll be a big Philly feel to this. Douche says the pity comes from him not knowing how to run a business despite being an analytics analytics analyst analytics expert and blowing his dad's money not his own no 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 douche i respectfully disagree with you anybody out there saying that he doesn't know how to run a business is wrong is wrong he just doesn't run it the way i want it you want it, Cornette wants it, and other people want it. He's got a TV deal on Warner Media where he's got Dynamite, Collision, Rampage, $155 million expected to increase a little bit. That guy may get another five-year deal, possibly, out of it. He's drawing... You know, not all that spectacular at the house shows, but 
he's running the business. He's just running it like a billionaire. He's running it. He Listen, I've always said, I've always said, how you get your wrestlers to wrestle at the top of their game is not just by paying them too much money, overpaying them. It's by sometimes having people feel that their job is on the line. The biggest mistake Tony Khan did was tell everyone, I will never fire anybody unless it's, you know, behavioral, you know, disciplinary. That if anything, I'll let their contract run out. So if you have a three-year deal, you know that for the next three years, your job is secure. You could kind of coast for maybe two, two and a half years. And then for the final three, six months, oh, let me turn my shit up a notch so I get a, a, a you know my contract renewed. I got news for you. When people are worried about where their, their next paycheck is going to come from, or they could lose their job to somebody else who wants it a little bit more, that's when people turn their shit up. When you are worried about losing something, that's when you go into overdrive. Why do you think when storms happen and you know you get earthquakes and flooding or you see like people just you know doing superhuman things to save lives, to save this, to save that. When you're pushed to the fucking max that you, I know this is an exaggeration, but people many times are at their best when they are pushed to the point that they have to produce. And Tony Khan is running AEW like a billionaire, privately owned company. If listen, guys, if I owned ten billion dollars and I was able to buy AEW, get on Warner Media, you don't think that I wouldn't hire some of my friends that maybe wrestle kind of Shangata, but you know, I, I you don't think that I would surround myself with people that you don't think I would sign people that I've been huge fans of for years and years and years. You know, I mean, when you start hearing about big time lawsuits, you start hearing about um, fines, violations, issues. When you start hearing about other things, then we go a little further. Problem with CM Punk and the problem with Miro and the problem with Malachi Black and others is that their mindset doesn't coincide with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Sammy Guevara and Jack Perry and everybody else that, you know, that were there. That, you know, even Darby Allen to an extent, you know, they try to play off that he's against the grain. Bullshit. So... You know, until you start seeing like things cancel, things in chaos, he's he's not running the business. Uh, doesn't know how to run a business. He's done a pretty good job for the last five years. Douche also says interesting. I'm the first one to actually give a number on the rights deal that I've seen. Oh, I don't know what. There were the years. I like I said, it, it, if he signs for another five years, even if there's an increase, you know, so be it. You know, it's this idea that he doesn't know how to run a company. You know, it's Paul Heyman. As much as I love Paul Heyman, Paul Heyman ran ECW okay in like 93 and 94 and once Todd Gordon was out of the picture like 96 97 but then by you know the later later part of the 90s you know you realize that he could run the company if it's small but once ECW got big that they could go pay-per-view and they could tour worldwide nationwide and stuff like that he couldn't run it and ultimately it filed for bankruptcy you know Tony Khan you know, you can you you cannot compare Tony Khan to 
Paul Heyman or anybody else that's that. No. All right. Two more questions and we're going to get out of here. Joe, uh, he says, uh, JD just had a little bit to say about Jade. I agree. Very run in a mill promo. Hope it gets better from here. Um, what was she supposed to do? A Mercedes Monet promo? You know, it's she's not the center of attention yet. They don't want to put too much focus and pressure on her. It's we're a week before WrestleMania. I'm not going to micromanage Jay Cargill's promo tonight. Um, she came out there just signing. You know, it's it. I don't want to compare it to like a Ken Shamrock or anything like that. But you know, I remember when Ken Shamrock first showed up and they had him sitting at ringside or, you know, Mark Henry signs or Kurt Angle signs or this and that. And they say a couple of words, you know, I mean, yeah, we know Jay Cargill signed with WWE several months ago. But tonight she is officially on SmackDown. It was just... It, yeah, it's not my, I'm not micromanaging a promo. Sorry. Um, now I hope you go on his show and say, "Well, Don Tony just said he's not going to micro." See that I'm not. There's none against JD. JD's family, but that's one thing that I don't like that people do is people run to my show and say, "Well, Jason Solomon's just said it before you." Well, JD said this, and Kevin Castle said this, and this person said this. And I'm like, well, do you go on their shows and say, well, Don Tony said this. If you don't, don't do it here. Eric Williams, what I think opens night one of WrestleMania. I have no idea. I don't know what matches are on which night. Becky Lynch said that she would love to open up night one with Rhea Ripley. I, I wonder if we get Jey Uso and Jimmy Uso. I wonder if we get Jey Uso and Jimmy Uso. That could possibly, maybe it's night two. I don't know. You almost feel it's got to be night one because of the tag match. I think that would be asking a lot to not only have Roman. Yeah, it's got to be night one. I, You know why Jay and Jimmy has to be night one? Because of its bloodline rules. If Jimmy has a match earlier with Jay and they already worked that night, it kind of messes up bloodline rules later on, especially since these two guys are going to get involved. So I don't want to see, oh, Jimmy's out there. He had a match early. I think Jimmy versus Jay happens night one, and I would not be surprised if it's one of the first matches of the night. All right, two more. Mark Hicks asks, do I think we will see Santana in the WWE? Uh, anything's possible. He could show up in NXT. I don't know if he, if he's if his worth is there. And listen, don't get me wrong. Rooted for Santana and Ortiz here in New York as much as Eddie Kingston and Homicide and anybody else the last 20 years. But Mike Santana, he doesn't stand out. Like, I don't envision him as a WWE personality. I don't see that. Could it happen? Sure. I never thought we would see Sean Spears back in WWE. Although I just personally, with all due respect, don't feel like he's going to mount to anything. He's just there to fill a spot in NXT, have a little name value. But... I don't see him leapfrogging a bunch of people. Dream 101 with the two spot. Thank you, Dream. He's looking forward to going to Barclays. Yes, this Monday it is not April Fool's joke. WWE will be at Barclays. First hour will be commercial free. Rock will be there. Roman Reigns will be there. Heavy, heavy, heavy build. Go home raw to WrestleMania. That's going to be a big deal. Big deal. I am so looking forward to it. That's why... I'm really hoping this Bray Wyatt documentary does become available early Monday. I really don't want to wait until 12, 15 in the morning to start talking about Raw. And especially if we're going to do a prediction show the next day or two days after, you know, need to get a little bit of rest. I do have a regular job that I have to go to. So, but have a blast, man. Have a blast. Brooklyn is going to be on fire Monday. Brooklyn... 
Barclays is only about 15 minutes from my house. And I drive past there sometimes. And even outside the arena, shit is crazy. So that's going to be a hot crowd. They were at Mohegan Sun tonight, where I always go with my wife. I mean, we're not going this year because of, you know, my puppy. But um, we go to Mohegan Sun a couple of times every year. They were there tonight. And we were even joking that if we didn't just get our puppy two months ago, we probably would have considered going to Mohegan Sun tonight and stay in the weekend and go to WWE SmackDown. So, all right. Uh, who hasn't asked the question yet? Uh, let's see. All right. R- Roderick says, could we see a women's match with no crossover or non WWE marquee names? For example, Ronda Rousey headline night to a WrestleMania. Ronda Rousey will not be back in WWE anytime soon. I want to get my hands on a book. I want to, I don't know if she's got this hatred for WWE as much as we think. I think the hatred is more Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon. Um, But no, I don't see non-WWE crossover. We might see some MMA people get announced. Celebrities are going to get announced. Wouldn't be surprised if a celebrity or an MMA person, male or female, gets involved at WrestleMania. I think that's something that nobody's talking about. Next week is the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I don't think you're going to see anything crazy yet coming out of that. One match that I am not looking forward to if it happens at Mania, I'm not looking forward to the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley versus AOP and Cross. I'm not looking forward to it. I just don't like the feud. I want it to end. You want to focus on Cross and Lashley? Fine with me. But I'm looking at what they're doing in the Street Profits. And, and if Dawkins is going to turn heel, so be it. Go for it. But they, there's no reason why the Street Profits are getting bitched out this bad. You know, they've been doing this now for a, over a year and a half. I'm kind of tired of it. And we will finish with Ghetto. Ghetto says Bronson Reed should win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I am perfectly fine with that. I'll tell you who I would also be fine with. Chad Gable. Listen, people are still holding out hope Chad Gable ends up a three-way with Gunther and Sami Zayn at WrestleMania. Ain't happening. Wrestling sometimes is supposed to break your heart. Chad Gable is the one that is breaking people's hearts this year. Chad Gable will get his R-Truth moment. And what I mean by that is a lot of people think R-Truth is going to win the championship at Mania, the tag title. I'm not comparing R-Truth's character to Chad Gable, but Chad Gable will get that moment where he wins a singles title, cries, audience cries with him, and it'll be a really special moment. Um, That happens in the next, you know, before 2024 is over. But for WrestleMania 40, Chad Gable, unfortunately, does not get the title shot. You want him to win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, I would be fine with that. I think it would be funny to see him coming out there holding that trophy all the time. But if Bronson Reed wins it, I'm fine with that as well. I am definitely fine with that as well. So, by the way, you know, special shout out to my friends out there in the Baltimore area. Few of you on our Patreon page, um, you know, we're bringing up what happened with the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And I had seen a little bit of it. Like I saw the aftermath and we were talking about, you know, other bridge collapses. And I'm a, I have a fear of heights to an extent. And I've told s- stories for years on Patreon, how I drive over bridges and I have channel vision. I have to look straight. I sweat. I get scared. I just have this fear of heights. I think since 9-11 because of that. But, you know, I saw what that, what happened with that ship. And, you know, I don't know if that could have been prevented. When you hear, you know, 4,000 tons, you know, I don't think people understand how much weight that is. That was just awful to see, man. Um, 
I'm kind of amazed at the alert system that they were able to call for May Day and they were able to stop the traffic on the bridge. I mean, that that's the thing that had surprised me because you watch that footage, you see that 18 wheeler going by and you see like another car or two and suddenly you don't see any cars. And you're like, you know, then it comes down and yes, there were construction workers on the bridge and everything, but you know, they were somehow able to right the split second, stop the traffic. It makes you wonder how many people they save, you know, how many lives they save because of it. But that's crazy shit, man. It's crazy that, you know, the, the, that ship lost power and it was just going right for that bridge. It's crazy shit, but it's awful. I didn't want to end on that, but I wanted to bring it up because after Tuesday, I watched a lot more footage. By the way, people stirring that controversy about the two birds disappearing. All that is, is that the TV station that was showing the footage froze the, the screen and they, they faded into a different screen and it looked like the birds just disappeared like as they went into the bridge. It was... There was no controversy there. It was just people trying to get Twitter ad revenue. So, um, yeah, Do says 4,000 tons is 8 million pounds of bridge. 8 million pounds into that bridge. That's insane. Makes you wonder, like, ships being that big, but you have to. When you're transporting that kind of shit, you have to. So, all right, everybody. I'm out of here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We went two hours. Uh, once again, just as a final reminder, Kev will be live with me on Monday. As of right now, we are doing regular time, not an hour late. I will confirm that with Kev over the weekend, and I will let everybody know all across all the platforms what time we start. Also, either Tuesday or Wednesday, Kev and I will be doing a preview and prediction show for WrestleMania. We'll see how many matches are made official by Monday night. We'll see if they announce other matches for, for night one specifically and night two specifically. If they don't, we'll get into all the matches that have been advertised, matches we believe are going to happen, any surprises, Cena, Austin, which is the big buzz, you know, which I had fun with on Tuesday. Because I remember on the January 29th show, Kevin and I had a discussion. Do you think, and we specifically said, do you think John Cena and Steve Austin could get involved in the match, especially with the history? with uh, And people are like, oh, I don't want to see that. Now all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, we got to see that. So have a good weekend, everyone. Happy Easter for those who celebrate it. I am going to get out of here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Spread the word. Let everyone know that uh, yours truly and Kev are back doing shows. You'd be surprised how many people still are not aware. And uh, if you really want to support what we do, besides spreading the word, download the shows. Download the shows. That's what keeps us relevant, keeps us in the hunt, in the, in the charts. And the more we are there, the more visible we are. And, you know, we want to grow. And the only way we can grow is, you know, with all of you. We, we, we don't, we, we, we're not Tony Khan billionaires and so we could just do it. Whatever happens, happens. So be well, much love. Happy Easter. I'm out of here. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the host. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're going to get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. 
See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup, and I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.